We're at the Rick Evans Grandview Prairie and Conservation Center where these guys are about to light a prairie fire. Let's find out how they do it. This is a drip torch full of diesel fuel and uh, it's designed to light the fire. It's our primary way of starting the fire. What we're doing is trying to uh, establish our black line here so that when we come around and get our more intense fire, our head fire we call it, um, we have a, a kind of a buffer zone it can burn into. And you always want to kind of light your backing fire first. It just gives your line an extra bit of protection. Right, because in the fire, once it comes this way, once it hits the stuff that's already been burned, it's not, there's no it fuel to There's no fuel to carry it, exactly. If the conditions were drier, then it might be harder to wet line. We would go ahead and mow this down to bare mineral soil which would then be a, a really good fire break for us and we wouldn't have to use our water resources. Yeah, they just turned the corner of their backing fire and just moved on just moved on to their head fire fire line. And what that means is now they're lighting the fire with the wind. Um, as you can see the smoke column and the fire is all moving into the unit which is a good sign because we planned for this to be our head fire line. And now we're in the place to where the fire's burning and it's clear, nice, fresh air. In the prairies, when you light the head fire off, it'll actually suck this back fire into it. Once we get the head fire lit, that's when our real, we'll get our good column, vertical development of our smoke column. And you can see that for, uh, probably from Hope. And something like this, this tree that's behind us, does this pose any kind of problem at all? I mean, can can a fire come up and get in the tree and the tree? No, uh, that's a good question though. Some species are really bad about doing that, in particular uh, cedar trees and young pines. And that can create things that are called spot fires, which are burning embers that go across your line. And those are bad. So I guess when you're doing your assessment, that's one of the things you assess and you figure out, okay, this tree doesn't pose a problem. Absolutely. Before we burn anything, we, we definitely we write, have to write a long, uh, a burn plan, uh, basically a prescription. Because in a grass fire, if you get a wind shift, it could blow across your other fire line. Uh, in the winter, the, dorm the dormant season, a lot bigger flame lengths, a lot faster, more intense fires. But in reality, they're just uh, they're not doing as much good on the woody hardwood kill than, than it burns at this time of the year. Once the burn's completed, we'll go through the unit and we'll look at things like uh, char on the trees, uh, what it's done to the organic substrate. Um, what it affects on the vegetation, kind of the scorch, um, and those are called immediate post-burn effects. We have objectives we set based on those parameters before the burn, and then we can check to see if we did what we said we were going to do. Do you want me to come up there and uh, do some secondary egg for you? You want me to kind of post here in the corner in case you get a weird wind? 